if I could second Walter's welcome. Uh, appreciate you all joining us today in our celebration of uh, Josh Wilburn's publication, um, The Political Soul, uh, came out, um, I think, very right end of last year, right? Uh, so recently um, from Oxford University Press. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you all, whether you are uh, zooming in from the Wayne State campus, uh, someplace in Metro Detroit, or uh, Nick, if I'm correct, you're out in Portland um, from a bit farther away. Thank you for accommodating uh, you know, the time zone and whatnot. Uh, as Walter mentioned, uh, may have mentioned, um, this is a relatively new program for the Humanities Center, it, uh, being able to use the Zoom format to, uh, to celebrate works uh, in the humanities by Wayne State faculty is one of the, uh, the definite um, silver linings of, of the pandemic, uh, an opportunity to, uh, to reach many more people than we would if we were restricted to, uh, to being on campus. So again, thank you. I don't want to take up too much time. Um, Walter, I think, uh, pretty much said uh, about our moderator, uh, Nicholas Smith, what I was going to. Um, I'm gathering from the chat beforehand, uh, many of you are familiar with him, uh, in addition to being a professor at emeritus um, of an endowed chair from Lewis and Clark College. He also is a very prolific scholar uh, in the fields of ancient uh, Greek philosophy and literature, and uh, certainly a, a very well uh, positioned person to, uh, to be, I don't wanna say interrogating, but to be interviewing uh, Josh about his publication. Um, just to give you a brief rundown for, uh, for the day. Um, so um, again, we're here to celebrate uh, Josh. Uh, an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at Wayne State. He's been on campus since I think 2013. That was my first chance to meet you, so this is also a pleasure for me. Uh, the order for today is as soon as I stop talking, I'm gonna turn things over to, uh, to Nick. Uh, and he and Josh are going to have a, an interview of sorts, a Q&A that will last maybe about 45 minutes. We'll kind of uh, just track how that goes. Uh, and then we will shift uh, to all of you and open up the, uh, the floor, the mic for you to have an opportunity to ask questions, uh, share comments, reactions, thoughts, whatnot. Um, if you would hold then those questions until we, uh, we get a, a sign from Nick that we are shifting to the Q&A, that would be great. Uh, if you would also use the reaction function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to raise your hand, uh, instead of posting comments and questions in the chat, uh, that is much uh, a much easier way to proceed given the, uh, the number we have in the Zoom. Um, so again, if you'd wait until we get to the Q&A, use the chat, and then um, uh, Nick will be moderating the, the Q&A and calling on people uh, as, as the hands come up. Um, one other thing just to keep in mind, this is a, an event that is being recorded and the Humanities Center will be uh, creating a YouTube um, link for this, uh, which will subsequently appear on the uh, Humanities Center website. Uh, and then it will also be available for distribution. So I just wanted to, uh, to make you all aware of that. Uh, without further ado, um, Nick, may I turn things over to you? Yeah, great. So first of all, um, congratulations. A, a book of this kind with Oxford is a very nice, a very nice achievement. And also uh, thanks to Wayne State for, for having, for hosting me and, and, and for having Josh. So uh, before we get to my questions, um, perhaps it'd be good for you to begin uh, by telling us, you know, what your book is about and explain what motivated your project. Yeah, sure. Uh, and so, yeah, first of all, I just I, I do want to second the um, gratitude to the Humanities Center. You all have been so wonderful in organizing this event, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I also want to thank you, Nick. Uh, Nick, uh, my, my first teaching job was at the University of Victoria out on the west coast of Canada. And Nick and I met early on in my career because we were sort of on the same uh, regional conference circuit. And he really went out of his way um, to sort of say encouraging things to me about my work at a time when I was sort of like riddled with imposter syndrome and needed the encouragement. And so I've always been very grateful for that. And so I can't think of anyone I'd rather have sort of here uh, interviewing me at this at this stage. So thank you. Thank you for all of that and for being here. So um, yeah, in terms of the project itself, I think uh, to sort of pan out a little bit, I think one of the things that really drew me to Plato from the beginning, from the time I was um, in graduate school, was his sort of preoccupation with uh, the project of self-knowledge. Uh, one of the inscriptions on the temple of the, the Oracle of Delphi uh, is know yourself. And that's a, that's a phrase that Plato 
um, brings up in six or seven different dialogues and explores as a theme sort of throughout his, his work. And for Plato, what it means to know yourself is ultimately to know our own souls or minds, our interior sort of mental life. And so a lot of Plato's work deals with what makes people tick, why people have the desires that they have, why we, why we live the, the kinds of lives that we lead, um, why we sort of interact with one another the ways that we do, why some people are uh, good and do good things and others are bad, et cetera. And so that has always been really interesting to me. And for Plato, one of his most sort of notable and influential contributions to that project of sort of exploring the self is his tripartite theory of the soul as it's, as it's known to scholars. So this was a theory of psychology that he first introduced in the Republic and that he explores in two of his other dialogues as well, the Timaeus and the Phaedrus. And according to this theory of the soul, the embodied human soul is divided into three sort of parts. And each of the parts is sort of responsible for and explains a different aspect of human motivational life. Um, it, each part is sort of res responsible for different kinds of desires that we have um, and explains different aspects of our behavior. So the first part is the reasoning part. And the reasoning part of the soul is the part that motivates us to pursue sort of what's good for us, what's best for us. Um, we want the truth, we want knowledge, we want wisdom. Reasoning and rationality is what is sort of the part of our soul that for Plato makes us seek those things. Um, think about what's best for us and then try to, try to go after that. Uh, the second part is the appetitive part that is uh, associated with sort of bodily needs and desires. So most fundamentally, it's the part of the soul that makes us um, thirsty and get hungry and uh, once have sexual desires. Um, and it's also the part that uh, sort of is at the heart of our desire to have things like money and luxury and wealth and property and, st and material stuff, because those are the sorts of things that um, sort of facilitate our achievement of bodily pleasures. Um, and finally, the remaining part of the soul is the spirited part of the soul, uh, or what's uh, called thumos is the term that Plato sort of uses as the namesake for this part of the soul. And the spirited part of the soul is responsible for a lot of what we would consider our emotional life. It's uh, responsible for things like feelings of anger, feelings of shame, um, and on my view, it's also the part of the soul that makes us sort of social and political creatures. And this, uh, this part of the soul, the third, the third part, the spirited part, is what this, this book is about. Um, and so I sort of chose this project, um, which is something I've sort of been working on for years here and there. My dissertation was on this. I published on it. Um, I really have found this project, its connection to self-knowledge really interesting, and I'm especially fascinated by the social and political dimensions of spirit and its connection to, to human emotions. So that's, that's the topic of the book, at least, is the spirited part of the soul um, and sort of why I got into the project in the first place. Oh, you are muted. Great. Uh, so let, let's pursue that just a little bit. Um, so uh, part of it, it's really a focus in your book, um, this, this part of the soul, the thumos. And most, uh, most scholars or translators have translated that as high spirit. Um, so can you say just a bit more about what is distinctive about your view of thumos? Uh, yeah. So. Um, I sort of have two goals in, uh, sort of two main goals in the book um, that uh, sort of frame how I, how I present Thumas and that I think are what, what is distinctive about the project. So the first goal is that I argue that spirit is the social and political part of the soul for Plato. So I mentioned that a moment ago offhandedly, but this is something that I actually have to defend in the book. So for Plato, the spirited part of the soul is what makes us concerned with others, um, other people, um, the, other, other things around us in our environment. It's what makes us care about and be concerned about others and our relationships to them. And it's responsible for the desires and emotions that make human social life and communities possible. And so to make that case, um, 
my account of Thumas, of Thumas or the spirited part is that it has sort of two closely connected aspects or sides, you might say. So the easy part of the argument is that spirit has an aggressive or competitive side. So spirit is the part of the soul that makes people get angry. It makes people want to fight. Um, when Homeric warriors are on the battlefield and are like, fighting, especially ferociously, um, it's Thumas that's doing that work for them, that's making them courageous. Um, spirit also makes us competitive. It makes us um, seek honor and compete with others to achieve honor and victory. Uh, and so historically, this sort of aspect of spirit of desire is very well known. And it's what commentators have overwhelmingly sort of focused on um, and I think often focused exclusively on. Um, but what's novel about my interpretation is that I argue that this is sort of only half of the picture, that that Plato also, or sorry, that uh, spirit on Plato's view also has this second side, this second dimension to it, which is that it's responsible for warmth and gentleness and affection. Um, so this gentle side of spirit makes it responsible for the feelings of attachment that we have to others, um, feelings of friendship, the care we feel for um, offspring, love, and also just like political fellowship, all the sorts of emotions that bind people together in families and communities. And both sides of spirit, I think, are necessary for understanding spirit as a political or social part of the soul and for understanding why it makes political life possible. So on the one hand, you need the aggressive side of spirit in political communities, um, especially if you're a Greek in Plato's time, because you need to be able to defend your communities um, through aggression and war against hostile outside cities. But on the other hand, you also need to be gentle toward your own fellow citizens and be sort of bound together in civic fellowship. Otherwise, you won't be able to sort of join together and, and form communities um, and social groups in the first place. Uh, and these two sides, I think, are actually connected for Plato in some really interesting ways that are underappreciated. So one of the ways this comes up is that when Plato first introduces the notion of spirit in the Republic, he draws on an analogy to uh, spirited noble dogs. And he points out that dogs have this interesting feature, which is that on the one hand, they're very gentle and loving and immediately affectionate when they know someone, when they recognize someone as familiar. Um, but on the other hand, they're also hostile and aggressive towards outsiders, towards those they don't know, towards strangers. And so um, I think for Plato, these represent, you know, th that's spirit, the spirited aspect of, of dogs that is making them that way for Plato. And it has the same sorts of effects in human beings, but in more complicated ways because we're more complicated creatures. And these, these sort of two, this two-sided account of spirit, I think um, sort of makes better sense of spirited desires. And we can also see ways that the two sides are connected to one another. So for example, um, Plato observed the fact that um, both people and animals fight the most fiercely to protect the things that they love. So um, you know, he noted, he notes that, you know, mother animals will fight really ferociously to protect their offspring. And there we see sort of simultaneously both aspects of spirited desire. On the one hand, the profound sort of like care and um, affection for the offspring, but at the same time, this hostility, which gets amplified to a stranger because of the threat that the stranger poses to those offspring. So uh, one of the things that's novel about my view is just that I argue that there's this second important side of, of spirit that is not always completely ignored, but definitely underappreciated um, and sometimes more or less ignored by um, a lot of previous commentators. So the first goal of the book is to argue that, that Plato, that this that spirit's the social and political part of the soul in that sense. The second goal is to show how Plato's views on politics, how his social and political philosophy are informed by his thinking about spiritedness. So the idea is that given that spirit is this social and political part of the soul in the sense I just described, um, it's going to turn out that for Plato, a lot of really urgent social and political problems that he wants to um, diagnose in the Greek world around him um, are problems that can't be resolved um, unless you pay attention to um, thumos and the spirited aspect of human psychology. And so um, what I do in the book is look at 
how Plato's sort of critical assessment of contemporary Greek and Athenian politics, as well as his constructive sort of positive solutions and ideas are, are all sort of shaped by his thinking about Thumos. And I uh, most obviously talk about how that plays out in the Republic, which is um, sort of his, his long political work that where he first introduces and explores the theory of tripartition at the greatest length. Um, but I also discuss how Plato's views on spirited motivation, um, sort of uh, how they play a role in his di uh, diagnosis uh, of and solution to social and political problems in dialogues that span the whole course of his career. So there's chapters on like the Protagoras, the statesmen, the laws. Um, and so th those are a couple of things that I think are sort of make my view of, of Thumas and spirit distinctive and sort of sets it apart is sort of related to these two main goals of the book. You keep getting muted. I mute myself in case the phone goes off, but then I stay unmuted when I'm oh. <laughs> again. So uh, not, not important. Uh, so in your book, uh, you make a point of discussing Plato's views um, in relation to the work of his predecessors and contemporaries. You make this quite a focus. Um, so can you say why you think this is especially important in the case of Plato? Yeah, I think that um, just generally speaking, my approach to history of philosophy is one that um, tends to focus a great deal on like cultural, historical, intellectual context. Um, and I think that that's especially illuminating to do in Plato's case. Um, when I prepared for this book, I spent the first year of the time that I worked on it just reading ancient Greek primary text to sort of set the scene for myself of what, what the cultural envi environment Plato was writing in. Um, and I think that that's especially important in the case of Thumos because Thumos as a sort of linguistic term has this really rich cultural history. It was the most common psychological term in, um, Hom in Homer, for example. It appears over 800 times in Homer. It appears frequently in the poetry of the fifth century of Plato's time. Um, and so it has a lot of like rich connotations to it. And I think that we understand what Plato's trying to do with Thumas and tripartition as well better if we take the cultural context into account. So uh, to give just two quick examples, um, one example is uh, sort of the aspect of my account of, of spirit that I've just said is sort of one of the original things, which is drawing attention to its gentle side, its feelings of warmth, friendship, affection, kindness, etc. cetera. Um, scholars have often noted that Plato's account of Thumas is indebted to its Homeric heritage and its, its use in poetry and have tended to note that, you know, it's the part of the soul that makes soldiers courageous and makes them angry and makes them fight and makes them proud um, and makes them care about pursuing honor. Um, but I think that what has been missing is that um, for, for the poets, Thumas is not just that. For the poets, as well as Plato, spirit has this kind of two-sided nature. So to give an example from, from Homer, um, when Odysseus returns, uh, returns home to his wife Penelope um, after 20 years away in the war and then his long journey home, um, she's initially sort of gives him a cold reception. She stands aloof from him. Um, and the reason is that she's just skeptical about whether this man in front of her is her real husband. Uh, in that scene, Homer describes Penelope as having this kind of like hard-hearted, cold um, thumos in her breast. And she's sort of criticized for that. But then once, once she finally sort of gives in and recognize, recognizes Odysseus as her husband, we find out that her, her thumos is warmed and she embraces him and then treats him the way that one would expect, uh, would expect her to. Um, and so in this scene, spirit is responsible both for this sort of coldness and aloof, aloofness and distance, but it's also responsible for the fact that Penelope sort of like breaks down and embraces her long lost husband. Um, so I think that we miss something if we, uh, uh, in Plato's account, if we don't look at this rich history of 
Thumas being responsible for um, all of these sort of this diverse range of, of, of emotions associated with friendship and kindness and love and, and all of that stuff. Um, that was just one example. I think giving a second example might, might take up too much time. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, so uh, take a different direction here. Scholars have, have generally drawn uh, to, been drawn to two main approaches to the interpretation of Plato, both of which um, have had um, anticipations um, in Plato's earliest readers. So developmentalists uh, with some historical precedent in the way that Aristotle reads uh, or reports Plato's views. Uh, developmentalists contend that Plato's views shift over time. Unitarians, um, however, and these were anticipated by members of Plato's uh, later academy especially, um, Unitarians see a strong unity in Plato's philosophical views throughout all of his works. Uh, your, your book uh, reads to me as if it's uh, mostly Unitarian in spirit, but sometimes uh, you, you draw short, you stop short of drawing stronger or definitive sorry, Unitarian conclusions. So how exactly uh, do you view the role in, of your book in relation to debates about the unity or development of Plato's thought. Yeah, thank you. So th this is something that I thought a lot about going into writing the book. So just to give like a, a, a bit more background uh, for those who don't know, um, the Republic is uh, supposed to have been written around the middle of the, somewhere around the middle of Plato's career. And that's the dialogue where we first see the tripartite soul and that theory of the soul. Um, we don't see it before that, and we see it in a couple dialogues after that that I already mentioned, but we don't see the theory explicitly appear in Plato's latest works. Um, and so commentators have had a range of views of, you know, how to interpret all, all, of, all of these, you know, how to interpret those, those differences. Some scholars think, well, before tripartition, before he introduces it in the Republic, in the earlier dialogues, um, he had just completely different views of psychology, and there's, you know, there's evidence to support, uh, to support that, that, that's very interesting. Um, other commentators think, oh, well, no, it wasn't necessarily the case that Plato had different views, but he, you know, is, is uh, it, when we take sort of dramat the dramatic context of the dialogues into account, for example, um, we, we, needn't, we needn't conclude that uh, he didn't accept tripartition or accepted a completely different theory. Um, and so there's, there's this debate about whether Plato's views develop and change over time or whether they're sort of more or less unified in their views of psychology. Um, because this is such a like crucial um, fundamental methodological difference in our field, um, I really wanted to write the book in a way that I didn't like lose half the audience um, right away. So I do talk about spirited motivations in works that predate the Republic. And I also talk about them in works that post-state the Republic um, where tripartition doesn't occur. Um, and what I sort of ended up doing was, and I, and I think this is, this is justified not just by my desire to sort of like have a broader appeal, but also, but like what I think the evidence what, what the evidence justifies as well. But when I talk about spirited motivations in early dialogues, like say the Carmides or Lockies, I use the term in a kind of neutral way. So what I don't mean is Plato already accepted tripartition when he wrote these dialogues. And when I talk about spirited emotions in these dialogues, I mean emotions that he at that time when he's writing already attributes to a spirited part of a three-parted soul. That, that's a really strong claim. I don't think the, the text can support that judgment with any kind of confidence whatsoever. So the way that I talk about spirited motivations in the early dialogues is I use the term spirited motivations in this neutral way to simply mean motivations that Plato will eventually go on to attribute to the spirited part of the soul once he introduces tripartite theory. Um, and so I think that this allows, um, you know, th the point is I want to draw attention to continuity in how Plato treats that class of motivations between the early dialogues and say the Republic. Um, and I want to, to draw attention to what I think are some underappreciated ways in which when we compare what Plato says about, um, you know, shame and anger, for example, in places like 
uh, the Carmides or Lockies, um, we find a lot more continuity than we might expect with what he says about the spirited part of the soul and its emotions in the Republic. Um, and so even a, even a developmentalist um, can get on board with that much and appreciate sort of like what I hope are some compelling arguments about the continuity that's there. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's a range of plausible interpretations of how, to, how what to do with that continuity once you've once you've sort of admitted or, or noticed it. Um, you know, the very strong Unitarian thing is, oh, Plato already accepted tripartition or probably already accepted tripartition in some form when he wrote these earlier dialogues. I, I just don't think that the evidence can support that. Um, I think that there are there are sort of multiple plausible interpretations of the data. And my, my aim is really just to draw attention to the continuity and um, sort of put pressure maybe against some, some of the stronger forms of developmentalist views. But I don't want to insist on developmentalism between the early dialogue, or uh, sorry, on Unitarianism between the early dialogues and the Republic, because I think, you know, we just can't know what was in Plato's mind when he wrote those. Um, and there's so, only so much that, that continuity can show for us. So uh, partly this appears in the title of your book, but um, it, it, it's clear when you read it that, that a lot of your book is orga organized around sort of two fundamental political problems uh, that you think uh, Plato views in terms of uh, the spirited, spirited motivations. Those are moral education and civic unity. Could you say more about the specifics of that? How exactly does your interpretation of Platonic Thumos provide resources for understanding his treatment of these two issues? Yeah, uh, thank you. So Plato is, I think, sort of throughout his career, almost obsessively preoccupied with um, two key social and political sort of challenges or problems that, as you, as you say, I sort of organized the book around. One is the, uh, uh, the issue of moral education. So Plato's very concerned about how to um, raise people in a society uh, properly so that they become virtuous, morally good people, and ultimately, for him, that means happy people as well. Um, Plato had a lot of criticism for the way that moral education worked in his time. He thought that there was a lot that was wrong with Greek culture that contributed to the fact that, in his view, most of the people around him were um, not sort of morally great people. Um, so one of his, his key challenges in as a philosopher is how can we make this better? How can we educate people um, to make them morally good people? And then the second issue is this problem of civic unity. So Plato is very concerned with the issue of how to create a stable and unified political community. Um, so one in which citizens broadly agree with one another, share a common sense of purpose, and feel sort of civic friendship um, or fellowship with one another. Um, and again, in Plato's time, um, there was not a great deal of civic unity. Um, Plato's time was very much characterized by constant fighting both between cities and within cities. Cities were full of um, political factions, divisions, uh, mutual enmity uh, among, uh, among citizens. Uh, I know it's hard to imagine a time when citizens are divided, but take yourselves back um, to the Greek world. And, th and that's the world that, that Plato is really grappling with and trying to sort of come up with some solutions for. So I think on both of these issues, my account of Thumas or, or spirited motivation sort of helps illuminate how Plato diagnoses these problems and also um, in particular, the solutions that he proposes for fixing them in places like the Republic. Um, so in the case of both, um, both of those political challenges, I think Plato's you know, his starting point is, as I said, uh, to, to return to my account or my interpretation of spirit, um, for Plato, spirited psychology not only makes us feel things like disgust, anger, shame, uh, or hostility toward people that we, uh, that we find strange or unfamiliar or that are outsiders or enemies, but it also makes us react with feelings like admiration, warmth, love, friendship, and so on to those who are familiar with us, those who are our kin, those who we consider sort of insiders or part of our group. Um, Plato's solutions to both sort of 
the challenge of how to educate people and how to establish civic unity, um, both of those solutions, I think, heavily engage this point about spirited psychology. So let me just give one, one uh, sort of specific example in the case of moral education. So Plato recognized that moral education is largely dependent on how we're brought up when we are young, from the, you know, from the time we're little kids. Um, and he recognized that how we're brought up is a fundamentally social process that involves our emotions. So Plato was aware of the fact that the people who have the biggest influence on us in our life are the people who are the people that we're around the most. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, our parents and family members have a great deal of, of influence on us and our, and our emotions. Um, and then, you know, the people around us in our communities and in our cultures, um, the people we see on television are an influence. Um, they're around us, they affect us um, morally. And of course they didn't have television then, but they did have poetry that they listened to and saw performed. And the characters of poetry are another sort of, sort of kind of influence. Um, and so the way that these people in our lives influence us and shape us morally when we're young is largely by way of emotions that Plato classifies as spirited. So to give a couple of specific examples, um, Plato is very concerned about the emotion of and feelings of admiration that we feel. Um, Plato recognized that who and what we admire has a great deal of influence on sort of what kind of people we want to be and how we ourselves act, what kinds of, of behavior we think is admirable and deserving of praise and emulation and which are not. Um, I can remember being a kid and, um, you know, I had one of those like little tykes uh, lawnmowers that, that blows bubble out of it. And I got that because my dad had a real lawnmower and mowed our lawn with it. And, uh, you know, I would, he would mow the lawn with the real lawnmower and then I would follow behind him with the little one that blows the little bubbles. Um, that's a case of, you know, what that illustrates from Plato's perspective is the fact that the people that we admire in our lives that we view as role models um, make us want to imitate them and emulate them um, and strive for certain kinds of ideals about, um, you know, not just mundane things like lawn mowing, but also like what kind of people uh, we want to be. Um, and another example is the emotion of shame. So when we do something wrong um, as children and our parents tell us that they're very disappointed in us, um, that hurts us and affects us morally and affects sort of what kinds of actions we think are appropriate or not appropriate. And so Plato recognized all of that and thought that, and, and what he tries to do in the Republic and also in the laws, in the statesmen, is curate the young person's cultural environment so that it's filled with more or less uniformly good, morally good people and influences. And the result, Plato thinks, is that people will learn to love and admire um, and imitate what's morally good on the one hand, and they won't be attracted to things that are bad or you know, morally wicked on the other. So I think that my, uh, my account of Thumas helps us understand the picture of what Plato's up to here um, in ways that previous accounts maybe can't do all the work of. Um, so commentators, generally speaking, have tended to agree that early education in the Republic affects the spirited part of the soul and maybe to, to some extent or another sort of aimed at it in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that how exactly it works becomes more mysterious if we leave out spirit's gentle side and sort of the facts about our psychology that that allows us to explain, the facts that we tend to admire the people we're around and absorb the influence of the people that we sort of love the most and admire the most. Um, and then just to sort of, um, I won't take up our time to get too into uh, detail about it, but if people have questions during the Q&A, just to kind of flag two other ways that my, my account sort of illuminates Plato's uh, approach to these two problems that I've identified. Um, so one is that I think that my account helps to explain why and how in Plato's theory of education, um, he really wants to uh, affect the spirited part of the soul in a way that um, concerns its relationship to the other two parts. So Plato is not just trying to train us to behave in certain ways. He also thinks that how we behave 
um, has a lot to do with what's going on in our internal psychology and in the relationships between the three parts of the soul, reason, spirit, and appetite. And so I think that Plato sort of um, takes advantage of or shapes the two-sided nature of spirit um, in sort of an internal direction in its relationships to reason on the one hand, which Plato wants to make very much sort of like a friend of sorts that uh, spirit loves, and appetite on the other, which um, is a kind of dangerous uh, influence in the soul that Plato wants spirit to be on guard against. Um, I also think that my account helps to explain some of the really um, sort of distinctive, um, infamous uh, social policies of the Republic. So um, in particular, among the uh, warriors and uh, rulers of the Callipolis, Plato sort of famously um, abolishes all private households, abolishes all private families, children are um, taken away from their parents at birth and raised by nurses so that nobody knows who their sort of biological child is. Instead, all the parents treat all the children as if they are their own um, in the Callipolis. And so this kind of communal lifestyle, I think, and what Plato is trying to achieve with it emotionally and how it works to promote civic unity on his view, I think that makes a lot more sense when we, when we take um, sort of both, both aspects of spiritedness into account. So let's talk about um, another part of the soul for a bit. Uh, it is a very interesting part of your book uh, that, that deals with, uh, with cognition. And I wanted to ask about that. So uh, interpreters have often supposed that cognition is really strictly the result of the activity of the rational part of the soul. Uh, but you don't see it this way. So how, how do the parts of the soul other than reason affect an agent's cognitive condition? Yeah, so the, the, the book is a, a book about the spirited part of the soul um, specifically, but it's also in a lot of ways a book about tripartition more generally. And I think it has to be because for Plato, the three parts of the soul are so interconnected with one another. I mean, they are ultimately three sort of integrated parts of, of each individual's personality. And so we can't fully understand spirit without also understanding reason and appetite. And so I do spend a fair amount of the book just sort of like laying out what I take the theory of tripartition to be, and also um, what, what spirit's relationships are to um, reason on the one hand and appetite on the other. And so to, to respond to your specific question, um, there are, I think, a couple of really interesting ways that for Plato, um, cognition and what we believe, the kinds of judgments we make morally, uh, are very much not, uh, not the result simply of sort of reason left to its own devices, but are very heavily influenced by spirit and appetite as well. So what we think and believe um, rationally for Plato, in other words, is very much sort of influenced by or determined by um, the condition of the lower parts of the soul and the relationship that they have to re reason. So, so two specific examples. So um, one is that Plato, as I mentioned a second ago, um, Plato thinks that appetite is really sort of a danger. It's sort of like the biggest threat to our virtue in the soul. Um, Plato thinks of appetite as the source of a lot of the desires that lead us away from what he considers to be unethical, morally good life. And the problem is not just that we have those desires, but also that, that those desires can sort of affect our reasoning about the choices that we have before us. So um, one way of thinking it, of it is that sort of the urges and desires that we have can lead us to rationalize behavior that we've otherwise would think is bad for us. So um, to give a personal example, um, I remember that years ago when I was a smoker, before I quit successfully, um, I quit unsuccessfully uh, multiple times. And each time that I, that I quit um, at unsuccessfully, the reason that it was unsuccessful is that I, you know, I'd go a couple of weeks without a cigarette and then I'd have a craving for one. And then I'd sort of start talking myself into why it might be okay to have a cigarette. I'd think, well, you know, yes, smoking's bad for you, but this cigarette isn't gonna be the one that kills me. Um, <laughs> Or, you know, I'll just smoke one. I've quit for two weeks already, so it's not going to start the habit again. Um, and so appetite can affect 
our judgments of what's okay and what's not in some really insidious ways. Um, spirit, on the other hand, uh, while appetite is this sort of threat to virtue in the soul, spirit for Plato, he calls it the ally of reason. For, for Plato, the spirited part of the soul can be this really important sort of non-rational or emotional um, support for its judgments that can help reason fight against the influence of appetite. Um, so whereas, whereas our repetitive urges can sort of lead us um, in the wrong direction, lead, lead us to sort of destabilize rational judgments that we might make, um, spirit can provide some sort of like additional resistance. Uh, and so, you know, here's a way that you might think of that. Um, when we are it, it, back in the cigarette example, it's not just that I don't want to smoke because I've recognized that it's bad for my health. Um, I also don't want to smoke if my spirited mo motivations are activated because maybe I think it's shameful behavior or maybe I think to myself, what would my mother think? Um, I'm now very conscious of the fact that my mother's in the audience today and probably thinks that I quit smoking a long time before I did. So I'm, I'm invoking um, the statute of limitations on that. But at any rate, you get the idea. So, so the non-rational parts of the soul can sort of influence our, our judgments for better and worse. Um, and then there's also uh, this other way that I think Plato wants, um, wants to exploit that spirited emotions can affect our reasoning even more directly, which is that spirited emotions can affect what kinds of rational judgments we make in the first place. So Plato recognizes that, or believes that during childhood, we're not fully rational. We start off sort of barely rational at all, um, and we gradually sort of mature as reasoning beings um, until we're, you know, sometime in our teen years. But our emotions are sort of there and active and thriving from the moment that we're born. So there's this large portion of our life um, where that, that's sort of really crucial for our moral, moral development, where emotions are the main thing that determines sort of our character, how we act, what we, um, how we behave, as, as I talked about a moment ago. Um, and I think that Plato thinks that, and this is something that I argue, that um, the emotions that we, um, and the emotional reactions that we cultivate while we're young through our moral education and upbringing, have a direct influence on the kinds of rational judgments that we make once we start reasoning about what's good and what's bad, what's just and unjust, what's shameful and what's admirable. Um, and you can see that that makes sense. So, you know, when, when we feel in, when we naturally instinctively um, are inclined to, to get angry at a certain kind of behavior, then once we start reasoning, we're also going to, because of we have that emotional reaction, we're going to tend to um, make the rational judgment that that thing that just happened was unfair or unjust and hence deserving of anger. Uh, and the same things with, with other kinds of um, emotions and, and corresponding judgments. So I think Plato thinks that our cognitive condition as human beings is really like depends in really crucial ways on how we're brought up and the kinds of emotions that, that are sort of cultivated in our character during that time. So if it's okay, I, I'll ask one more question before turning it over to, um, uh, to others. Uh, but I wanted to uh, just have you talk a little bit about, you, you've talked a lot about the Republic and, and it's sort of its place in, in, the, in the corpus. But I, I wanted you to focus on another feature of the book that you haven't said as much about yet. And that is uh, one of the ways that Thumos turns, turns up in unexpected places in your account um, is in the myths of the statesmen and the laws, which most people regard as later works than the Republic. Could you say a more about what role you think Thumos plays in those myths and how the two myths um, are related or parallel to one another? Um, yeah, so let me just um, talk, uh, maybe focus on uh, the, the statesmen. Um, so the statesman is one of Plato's later works. And one thing that is interesting for me here is that I think the case for Unitarianism is, is stronger in the case of Plato's late dialogues than it is in the case of his early dialogues. In other words, um, well, here, here's why. I, when we look at an early dialogue like the Euthyphro or Carmides or, or Lockheed's, there's just no way for us to know whether Plato had ever conceived the theory of tripartition yet. 
Um, by contrast, when we read his late works like Statesmen and Laws, we know that he already has thought about the, the, the theory of tripartition and worked it out in great detail in his dialogues. And so what I argue is that when we apply that theory to the uh, dialogues like the Statesmen and Laws, there's a lot that gets illuminated um, and that makes better sense when we take tripartition into account. Um, and so I think that given that we see that continuity between tripartition in the middle dialogues like the Republic uh, and then later dialogues like Statesmen and Laws, I think it's less plausible than in the case of the early dialogues to think um, that Plato just like completely abandoned the theory. I think that when we look at the continuity, we can say, look, there's a lot that is illuminated um, about the Statesmen and Laws if we think that Plato um, still accepts some version of tripartition and that it's doing work for him sort of behind the scenes of the dialogue. Um, so in the case of the Statesmen, um, yeah, what I do in that, in that dialogue, it, it, it was kind of my favorite chapter to write. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to, to do it justice uh, in this moment, but the, there's sort of two key discussions in the Statesman. One is uh, this myth at the center of the dialogue, and the other is this sort of closing discussion. So the Statesman is organized around the question, what is the Statesman? What is the politician or the politicos? And what is statesmanship? So it's trying to define those two things. Early on in the dialogue, um, we have interlocutors that suggest that um, statesmanship might be like a kind of human herding or shepherding. So the statesman is kind of like a shepherd um, leading the flock that is the citizens. And after that proposal is made, um, the visitor, there's an anon anonymous visitor who's uh, sort of the main speaker, um, says, stop, we need a kind of reset in this discussion. And he presents a myth that's designed to sort of draw attention to the shortcomings of that conception of statesmanship as shepherding. And in the myth, what he does is depict, um, it's this kind of cosmological myth that depicts two sort of phases of um, human or humanoid history. So we have this early phase where um, human beings are directly taken care of by the gods. Um, the gods take care of all of their physical needs. Um, they have no need for shelter. Um, they also have no need for family or reproduction because human beings actually just sprout up out of the earth and that's how they're reproduced. Um, the gods, however, at some point stop taking care of us. And after that, human beings have to fend for themselves. And that's when they start forming cities and communities. And so what we have here is essentially pre-political human beings and post-political human beings in the myth. And what I argue um, without getting into the details is that um, the pre-political humans, what we, what we see in Plato's depiction of them is that we just see a world without any spirited motivations. And that makes sense given my view that spirit is what makes us social and political creatures. Um, that in a world where there is no sort of social life, where human beings are directly taken care of by the gods, there are no cities yet or communities, it makes sense that we also see this corresponding lack of spirited emotions. By contrast, once human beings are political, they become um, spirited and we start seeing the introduction of the second half of the myth is just shot through with the terminology of the spirited part of the soul and emotions associated with it. And ultimately what I, uh, go on to argue is that in the final discussion of the dialogue, when Plato finally does identify what statesmanship is, it turns out to be something, you know, an art that requires careful attention to the spirited elements of our nature. And I think that what was wrong with the conception of uh, statesmanship as mere human herding in the beginning of the dialogue is that human beings aren't just animals that have you know, all you have to do to, you know, maybe herd cattle is make sure that they're fed. Um, you just satisfy their repetitive needs. And so he dramatizes that by showing us what, what, what statesmanship would have to look like for human beings to only have repetitive needs that need satisfied. And it's this kind of weird, um, divinely controlled world. Um, but what he wants to draw attention to is the fact that human beings aren't like that. We don't just have repetitive needs. We also are, are characteristically, uh, spirited and that's those moreover are the emotions that are most relevant to our social and political lives. So that's that's an example of how I sort of apply um, very briefly how I apply sort of the account to some other dialogues.
So uh, let me turn it now over to uh, members who are in the audience who have come. Um, let me remind you, please use the raise hand function. Otherwise I won't be able to track that you, that you wanna uh, ask a question or make a comment. So use that and it's, that's in the reactions um, bottom of your screen. Uh, David. Hey, Josh. Uh, thanks for this. Thanks, Nick. This I, I haven't had a chance to, to look at the book yet. I'm really looking forward to reading it. But I asked the question from a, a position of true ignorance. So um, what I'm wondering about is what your take is on the Phaedrus and the Timaeus, especially the Timaeus, where I wouldn't have thought that the social side of Thumos would be so strong in what its function is. And so I guess I had thought that you might even think in terms of I mean, it seemed like one aspect of your view was that Thumos is connected to care, not just to shame and to courage, but also to caring. And I could see how that could even happen within a psyche. So Thumos could be involved in the care, but then it wouldn't be fundamentally social in terms of dealing with other people, but it would become a sort of intra-psychic um, care. But then given what you said to Nick in terms of no, really what Thumos is, even in the Statesman, is it's connected to fundamentally social activity. And th this just takes me back again to wondering what are you thinking with the Phaedrus and the Timaeus in terms of the, the social aspect of spirit? Um, yeah, so, so this raises, or I think this raises, thank you for this, this question. Um, <clears throat> a question that concerns um, one line of criticism that has been out there of, so there's, there's been a couple commentators um, previously who have um, considered social or political interpretations of, of spirit and have rejected it. And the reasons that they've rejected it is that um, a lot of spirit's functions are, as you say, like intra-psychic functions. It's not about how we relate to other people, but also how spirit is related to the other two parts of our own souls. Um, <clears throat> and I have a couple of things to say to that. So, so first, I think that um, it's a little bit more complicated than just, um, actually, let me, let me say a couple of things. Um, so there are two, there's, there's stronger and weaker versions of the social and political interpretation. Um, the strong version is all of our social and political, all of our distinctively social and political motivations are spirited ones, and all spirited motivations are distinctively social and political. Um, the weaker version is all of our distinctively social and political motivations are spirited, but it's not necessarily the case that all spirited motivations are distinctively social. Um, and I think that I actually accept the strong version, but I think that for the most part, I only need the weak version to do most of what the book is trying to do. So there's controversy over whether it makes sense to talk about um, sort of the socialness of spirit's relationship to reason on the one hand and appetite on the other. And I think that I'm okay with thinking of that still in social terms in part because Plato heavily uses social metaphors to describe those relationships. Um, so um, for example, in his account of early education in the Republic, uh, and so sorry, just to flag what I'm about to say for people who might not be as familiar with the terminology, um, I sort of orient spirit's two-sided nature in relation to the familiar and the unfamiliar, the terms for which are the oikeion on the one hand um, and the elatrion on the other. And so the idea is that spirit reacts with warmth and love and care to the oikeion, and it, re it reacts with um, you know, hostility and so on to what's a latrion or stranger form. So in Plato's account of early education, there's this really interesting pa uh, passage where he talks about how um, because people are surrounded in the ideal city by sort of homogeneously uh, morally good cultural influences, 
Um, they'll like love and they'll have the right, they'll love and admire the right things while they're still young before they're rational, before they have reason yet. Um, but then he adds, but when reason does arrive, um, they'll warmly welcome it because of, because of it, uh, because they recognize it as oikeion. Um, and so, and, and warmly welcome is this kind of relatively rare verb that is the same verb that Plato uses to describe the reaction that spirited dogs have when um, you know, their owners come home and greet them. So I think that what's going on here is that we're seeing that Plato wants to curate the cultural environment so that um, we have spirited reactions, not just to the right people around us, but so that when we start making morally good judgments rationally, those moral judgments are going to just like feel or seem familiar and to sort of match up with the world, with, with sort of uh, the world as spirit knows it and wants it to be in a way that will activate our spirited emotions. And so I think that um, Plato does invoke social metaphors and political metaphors when he talks about how the parts of the soul interact with each other. And at the end of the day though, I, I kind of wanna say, if people want to insist that it doesn't count as social when it's intrapsychic, that's fine. Like, I, I mean, for me, the more fundamental thing is oikeion and elatrion and the sort of dual reactions to those two things. Does that can answer I, your question? Can I have a quick follow up? Is that all right? Please, please yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess what I was wondering is the Republic is political. I don't have any yeah. doubts about that. On the face of it, when I look at the Timaeus and the discussion of spirit in the Timaeus, it just doesn't seem political. It doesn't seem social. And so what I was wondering is, is spirit fundamentally social or is the Republic a political work in which the social aspects of spirit play a particularly important role because it's a work of political philosophy and we're thinking about what the ideal city is. And so, that's why I was bringing up the Timaeus yeah. and the Phaedrus in terms of, is this a general feature of spirit or is it something, I mean, surely you're right that it's true across many dialogues, but is it sort of always true or is it when he's focusing on the social aspect? Yeah, so I think that, um, I, think, I think, so the Timaeus is maybe the, the even harder case than the Phaedrus, so let me just maybe focus on that. And I think that, um, I have two answers to that. So one is that I think there's um, the, the political is definitely less sort of conspicuous and at the forefront. Um, but as you say, that's because, it, I mean, it's just not, it's not a political dialogue. It's, you know, by the time he introduces the spirited part of the soul in the Timaeus, he's really focusing on like the human body and physiology and how the spirited part of the soul sort of is related to our, you know, the heart and other organs and interact with the other parts of the soul. So part of my answer is just like Plato has a very, very different focus there um, that doesn't require him to get into the social, which would kind of be inappropriate in that context. But the second thing I want to say is that even in the Timaeus, I think that we can see um, th the social aspect there. So I mean, one of the one of the only things we learn about spirit in that passage is that spirit boils over with rage when someone does us an injustice, when reason informs it that we've been done an injustice. So there we see like one of the characteristic things we, we, we learn about spirit is how it's reacting to um, you know, what, what other people around us are, are doing. And um, yeah, so, so that, that's, that's my, my answer to that, I guess. Mark Constant. Sorry, an answer. Hi Josh, nice to see you and congratulations. Hey, hey, hey. Um, so I have two questions, but I'll be good and just ask one. I'll come back with the other at the end of this time. Um, so in, in the Republic, uh, there's a depiction of a person whose soul is ruled by spirit, the spirited man. It is a man in that context. And this person has a very particular character. Um, so they're, um, they're not at all sort of um, caring and affectionate, but rather um, harsh to their inferiors, including their slaves, competitive, uh, militaristic, overly attached to physical exertion and uh, activity, um, uh, proud. Um, so uh, I, I'm wondering, um, so I haven't read, read your book yet, by the way, like David, I look forward to doing so. Um, 
But I'm wondering how, why the person whose soul is dominated specifically by the spirited part of the soul has that particular kind of personality on your account. Yeah. Um, and, and just to, so, so, okay, a couple of things about the, the democratic individual or the person ruled by spirit. So, so one is that I think, again, even in that description, we can see sort of evidence of what I'm thinking of as the gentler side. So we learned that the person um, wants to rule, they want power, but we also learned that they are obedient to, uh, be, to the to superiors who rule them. Um, I think that that obedience is, you know, the gentler side of spirit that we're seeing in evidence. Um, I also think that, you know, Plato in the Republic tends to, um, in a lot of passages, emphasize the um, sort of more aggressive and competitive side of spiritedness. So when he um, sort of gives a, a, a quick rough and ready uh, summary of what the three soul parts each desire in book nine, he talks about spirit as the part that loves honor and victory and good reputation, all things that are attributable to its aggressive side. Um, and so correspondingly, you know, as a, a, that sort of complements your question, which is the, the person ruled by spirit is somebody who tends to pursue those things. I think those points are related. I think that Plato thinks that, um, you know, when he defines spirit or talks about spirit as seeking honor and victory, what he's doing is um, identifying the sort of conspicuous things that somebody ruled by that part of their soul sort of organizes their life around. Um, it's less clear what it would mean to organize your life around like caring for your, your offspring. But we can imagine, um, we can imagine in Plato that, you know, what he says about the democratic individual is certainly compatible with the thought that the democratic individual is you know sensitive to honor and dishonor and presumably has people in his social group that he is going to be especially um sort of uh sensitized to protecting uh and so i think that there's still um even in the democratic individual we can still see there's plenty of space for the the two sides of spirit and i think um a, another way of of putting the point or putting this idea is that I see the two sides as being sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, as I sort of said, as, as the example of like a, a, a dog protecting its young was sort of designed to bring out. And so I think that it's, it's not necessarily the case that when we see one side of spirit, we are thereby sort of like, it's at the exclusion of the other side. I think that they're often working together. Um, in Homer, there's a, you know, there's a famous speech when uh, soldiers are being roused for battle, and they're told by their commander, um, have shame, think about your friends and family and your children and wives back home. Um, and then as a result of that, they become courageous and, you know, their thumos swells and they fight, they fight fiercely. Um, so I think that, like, the two sides are sort of always right there together. Um, and the fact that we see one sort of conspicuously dominating the life of that individual doesn't at all mean for Plato that the other side is not there as well. Thank you. Bruce Russell? You're muted. Oh, good. Yeah, I, I was looking for I unmute. Um, so there's kind of a slogan that says that uh, for Plato, justice in the soul is harmony in the soul. And I take that to mean it's uh, these three parts sort of playing their uh, appropriate role with reason and control and the spirit element supporting it. And I don't know, the desirable, the desiderative element, I guess, providing motivations to act or something like that. And at the beginning of the groundwork of metaphysics and morals, Kant says that basically that can't be right because he considers the example of a clever villain, which he imagines has reason and control, and yet is not just. I, I, he doesn't you know, enlarge upon what the clever villain does, but I say to my students, well, imagine he's a bank robber and you know, cases a place that doesn't try to rob too many banks because his likelihood he'll get caught is increased and so on and so forth. You get the general idea. And so I don't know, I wonder what, what Plato might say to this apparent counterexample and say, well, I wasn't looking for necessary truths or you don't have the proper understanding of rationality or exactly what I think Kant would say then, well, 
why do, what's your defense of this concept of rationality you're presupposing uh, when it comes to justices having reason and control? So anyway, I just wonder what you think Plato might say to Kant in this example of the clever villain. So um, I think that, that for Plato, clever villains are very much compatible with his theory of justice in the soul, or at least Plato thinks they are. He, Plato was very much, um, very much thought about clever sort of criminal masterminds. That was something he, he thought about. And one thing that we, you know, can posit about criminal masterminds is that they're very smart. They use their reasoning to uh, commit crimes in often really complex, um, interesting ways. So what, what does Plato think is going on in those cases? Um, well, for, for Plato, I think, um, and Mark Johnson, uh, who just asked a question, has, has work on this that's, that's relevant, and I more or less accept his, his, his view of this. Um, what it means for a part of the soul to rule in the soul and to be in control of the soul is, um, among other things, for the characteristic objects of that part's desire to be the parts around which, the, or, or the objects of desire around which the person organizes their life. So when reason is in control, ruling in the soul and doing its own job in the soul, um, in Plato's sense, it means that the person is going to be organizing their life around the characteristic objects of rational desire, which are truth and wisdom and goodness. Um, by contrast, Plato thinks that somebody like a criminal mastermind is somebody who's, who's um, soul is ruled by appetites. I mean, say that they're, let's just suppose that they're um, motiva motivated by greed. They want money and stuff. Um, then they are, they are ruled by the appetitive part of the soul. And part of what it means for them to be ruled by the appetitive part of the soul is that appetite has sort of, and its influence in the soul has perverted the person's reasoning in such a way that the person now believes you know, getting money at all costs is the right way to live my life. Um, under appetite's influence, they've come to have this mistaken rational judgment about what the good life consists in. And so then once they've made that judgment under reasons or under appetite's corruption, they then devote their sort of rational faculties and resources toward trying to do the thing that they've now identified as good. Um, but Plato would just say, yes, that, that, that villain might be extremely clever, extremely um, extremely sort of rational in the sense of good at using their reasoning to um, instrumentally sort of achieve the ends that they've set for themselves, but they don't count as just or ruled by reason in Plato's sense. Yeah, thank you. Patricia Marischal. Hi, uh, thank you so much and congratulations. Um, so I haven't read the book yet, uh, but um, I'm very interested in the two aspects that you mentioned, the love and tenderness and the anger aggressiveness. Uh, and I can see how those aspects are there, uh, but I was thinking about a third role or function or aspect to spirit um, that uh, I would like you to say a little bit about, uh, whether you think it's there and how it relates to these two aspects that you identify. And that is that spirit um, is what makes us stick to our rational resolutions and our rational decisions and carries out practical judgments. Uh, so the role of a spirit there is something like what makes you stick to your resolutions. And is, it is in that sense that spirit is the ally of reason. And I think you are sympathetic to that kind of reading, but I was wondering how this aspect of a spirit, the um, function of a spirit as that which makes you endure and have a will, a strong will, and stick to your rational judgments, uh, interacts or um, uh, how it relates to these two different side of the spirits that you have been emphasizing. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, that's that's really great. Um, and yeah, so I think that that is very that's very much like something that I want my view to be able to account for. And so again, just to give a little bit of background. So in the Republic, Plato defines the virtue of courage as a virtue that is that that the spirited part of the soul is sort of like uniquely responsible for in an important way. Um, and so, courage, as he defines it, is um, spirit's preservation through pleasures and pains of reason's judgments. Um, and so what he means by that 
um, to just kind of take it out of Plato speak, is that our appetites, which make us averse to pain and make us sort of pleasure seeking, will sometimes lead us, as we talked about earlier, to wanting things that we have judged to be bad for us. So we, we judge like, I'm not going to smoke anymore. Um, and appetite the part of us that leads us toward the pleasure of smoking and, and, and puts up resistance to that. So we count as courageous in Plato's sense when the spirited part um, basically keeps, keeps reason judgment safe is, is the sort of another translation of the Greek, the Greek term. Um, and what it means to keep them safe is among other things to make sure that we don't change our minds about what to do and that we then act on, how, what, on what we do. And I think that this goes back to the issue of um, sort of the Alatrion and Oikeion, familiar and unfamiliar distinction that I mentioned before um, internally. So I think that Plato really wants to make spirit um, view reason and its judgments as something that is familiar Oikeion and hence something that needs to be protected um, and fought for. Um, and conversely, any appetites that we might end up having that are vicious um, or that lead us toward behavior that we judge to be bad, um, Plato wants spirit to be sort of emotionally disposed to view those as like enemies in our soul and hence to fight against them. And so I think you're, you're exactly right that part of what spirit is doing is um, making sure that we stick to our rational judgments um, and that, that that's this important part of, of what it's doing. And, and what I want to say is the reason it's doing that is because of this um, relationship of familiarity that Plato has tried to cultivate between, between the two parts of the soul. And, and Plato is, just as a side note, is doing something kind of interesting there um, in that he's sort of appropriating the Greek language of the traditional virtue of courage and reworking it for his own purposes. So in, in a lot of early Greek literature, one of the sort of um, standard formula that, that you find for, you know, an answer to the question, what is courage, is that it's keeping your friends and, and, and loved ones safe. And so Plato is saying, yes, courage still is safekeeping. But for Plato, what's most important is our own virtue, our own rationality. And so um, it's not just our friends and loved ones that we need to keep safe, but our own virtuous judgments. Um, and our reasoning that we need to sort of like protect against the appetites within us. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Before I call on the next questioner, I wanted to say, no one ever mispronounces my name, strange as it may seem, but I routinely mispronounce names and I'm afraid I may have uh, mispronounced the name of our last questioner. Would you like to correct my pronunciation? Me? No, it's okay, <laughs> it's uh, perfectly fine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now I'll mangle the next one. Uh, is it Yara Strabing? It's Jada. Jada, Jada Okay. I, thank you. Somebody needs to correct me. Thank you. Okay. Jada Strabing. Um, I keep unmuting myself and then it's mutes again, but I think you can hear me now. So. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So um, I just had a question about how you differentiate the, what goes into the um, into thumos and the appetitive part of the soul. And I just thought of the, you know, example of, you know, when you have um, like a new child and like the, the deep love that you feel for like a brand new child just feels just so in instinctual, you know, and, and, and you're going to classify that I think under thumos and not under like an appetitive sort of thing. Cause I think the, as I understood you, all the cares and loves and things end up in the um, in thumos in that part of the soul rather than the appetitive part of the soul. So I just want to, but yet it also just seems like just um, very instinctual. And so I wondered, you know, am I right about that you would put it in Thumas? And then if you would put it in Thumas, obviously it doesn't have to do with what's instinctual or not. And then I wondered from that with the, with the appetitive part, does it just have to do with pleasures and pains or what ends up being under the appetitive part if it's not just like what's instinctual or not instinctual? Yeah, thank you. So I think, um, yeah, I definitely would classify those as spirited, and I think Plato would as well. And I think that instinctual would be a misleading way to try to distinguish between appetitive and spirited, because I think Plato, Plato thinks that um, human beings from the very moment that we're born have both appetite and spirit. And so those are already motivating. They sort of both jointly 
count as our instincts from the time that we're infants and then leading into our toddler years and, and beyond. And he also thinks that there are, you know, most animals are both appetitive and spirited as well. And they are also sort of acting on their instincts. So I think that um, the appetites, I do think that what, what distinguishes them is that they're concerned with bod bodily needs and pleasure and pain. And I do think that's at the heart of, um, and I think Plato thinks th that's what is ultimately at the heart of all of our appetitive motivations that we might have. Um, and so uh, Plato um, talks about like the fact that um, like spirited animals will sometimes um, starve themselves in order to feed their, make sure that their young are fed. Um, and I think there we see a conflict between appetite and spirit, even in, in animals. Um, because on the one hand, if they're starving, then their repetitive parts are, they're hungry, they're driving them toward, toward food. But on the other hand, their care for their children is making them sort of resist that, um, that desire for food for the sake of feeding their young, which they love. So does the, would Plato think that that would automatically have to be two parts of the soul because you can't have two conflicting desires in the same part of the soul? I think, I think so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. While others are thinking of what questions they might like to ask, I, I'd like to follow up on Ajayda's question. Yeah. Uh, if I could. Uh, so, you know, one of the, the reactions that she's talking about to a young baby, uh, uh, are ones I recognize, and and I and I, this is a follow up actually um, on something that I had asked earlier that you responded to earlier uh, when you talk about the caring for other people uh, being the the, the 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 role of thumos, um, because you know not not all of the ways in which we're interested in other people would go to thumos right we want to have sex with them that yeah. doesn't just go to thumos. Uh, right. And and so I think that one of the things that tripart oh and if we also want to partner with them in the pursuit of uh, moral improvement, that wouldn't necessarily all be thumos either. So uh, right that some of that would at least be our rational desire for what's good. So um, I'm, I'm wondering about the baby case again, okay. a, a little bit. I want to I want to go back to that because you know one of the things that happens. Uh, 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 at least in my memory, is you love the smell of them. I mean, not, not when they need to be changed, but, um, you know, they're adorable and you move, 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 you know, you do all these things that are quite uh, strange for other people to watch if they've never been through that. And, and I wonder if all that goes to Thumos or if some of that couldn't be a kind of just appetitive urge you have for, for uh, there's a wonderful Chinese expression uh, about, that kind of response, they call it yokan, which is just means you know, pinch them, you know, they're so, and it feels, at least to me, very appetitive. And so I'm wondering if you wanted to limit um, one's response to babies in particular, yeah, or puppies or kittens for that matter, right, to being just thumos, right? Surely that, surely even Plato can accommodate a certain complexity in the ways in which we respond to other human beings particularly human beings like babies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that um, I, I completely agree with what you just said. And so I think that Plato, um, I think that the reason that it's true that it can be both appetitive and spirited, the sort of like something about our attraction to our young. I don't know about it because children are very loud, so I don't have any, but, um, but I've heard um, about people, from people who love their children or just you know being in love in general, we can say is feels good. Like it feels good to be in love and feels good, not just in a spirited way, but sometimes it can just like, literally there can be like a bodily euphoria in the feelings that you have for someone. And yeah, finding them pleasant smelling is another example. And so in as much as our emotions can um, sort of affect our physiology itself and the bodily sort of feelings that we have, that's then something that registers to appetite and that appetite is sort of um, tuned into caring about. And, you know, in as much as it feels good to love things and smell them, um, appetite is going to motivate us to, to do those things. So I, I absolutely do think that um, appetite is, it can also provide these, these motivations, but I think um, they, yeah, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. I think, I think you're right that the complexity is there and Plato can't account for it. 
David wanted another question. I just wanted to follow up briefly on Patricia's question. I think you suggested, Josh, that spirit would be involved in both considering as one's own the deliverance of reason, but also considering as not one's own appetites that are judged as bad for us and you know, other things that are perhaps in our soul, but we wish weren't in our soul. And I thought that was a very interesting idea and I didn't, no passages or any particular things came to mind. Uh, in the Fido, there are some places where I think he's very interested in this idea that there's things that are foreign to our soul that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you had thought, you know, are there places where we get that sort of idea that spirit is involved in thinking that some things within our soul really are alien to us, shouldn't be there, and spirit is involved in trying to push them away. Um, yeah, so um, I think, so So there are passages. One, one of the ones that I mentioned, the one I mentioned before from the from book three was one about recognizing reason as oikeion. Um, there's also a kind of parallel um, or complementary passage uh, in also book three um, in the discussion of physical training where Plato is talking about um, good, like what it, what it takes to be a good judge of character. And he talks about how um, good, you know, he says in the case of doctors, he, he draws a contrast with doctors. He says in the case of doctors, you know, the best doctors are people who have experienced both health and a wide range of diseases themselves, because then they know sort of what it feels like and how to, how to fix it. But when it comes to judges of character, you don't want somebody who has experienced both virtue and viciousness. Um, rather, he says, they should, they should view viciousness as something alatrion, foreign in their own souls. Um, and so I think that that's another, another passage that sort of draws attention to this idea that like, you know, if, an, if a bad appetite arises in us, our spirit is supposed to be sort of like wired up or, tr or rather trained in such a way that it just sort of like instinctively reacts again it, against it as something to be sort of thought. I have further thoughts here, but I see Chinsia has a question. She hasn't spoken, so. Yeah, there's two more questions and given time, I think we'll probably um, close with these. Uh, Chinsia Rusa? Oh, you're, you're Hello. Hi. Hey, well. Yes. Sorry. Um, so thank you for this presentation. It's very fascinating and I really look forward to reading your book. I wanted to ask you just whether in the book you also trace some of the differences that there may be between uh, the various presentations of Timos, um, you know, from dialogue to dialogue. And also I wanted to ask you whether you, you do deal uh, in the book with the um, too most in the Phaedrus, or are you dealing only with the strictly political dialogues? Because one of the elements of puzzlement I have uh, in that case is that in the Phaedrus, Tumos seems never to conflict with reason at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it is always on the side of reason. And this is not the case in the Republic where Tumos can go wrong um, pretty badly and can actually conflict with reason in uh, egregious ways. So I wanted to ask you whether it, you can say something about the, dif you know, what differences you trace in the various presentations or tumors in the various dialogues. Thank you. And sorry, I have to turn off the camera because I'm cooking, sorry. Yeah, no, no thank you so much um, for your question um, and for being here. Um, yeah, so I do think that there are um, differences in how Plato presents and what he does with Thumas in different dialogues. And I think that, um, you know, what I argue or um, sort of my approach to that is that what it reflects is more about the internal aims of each particular dialogues and the characters that are there and what the characters are trying to do, then it does about, it doesn't necessarily, in other words, um, indicate changes in Plato's view about Thumas, but there's definitely some differences in what gets focused on in different dialogues. And as you say, in the Phaedrus, um, it seems like spirit is something that just never conflicts with reason. Um, and, some commentators think that that's actually just true generally. So like um, Rashna Kantakar in her um, 
uh, I think 2017 book, Plato's Moral Psychology, argues that um, spirit never, it, it always follows reason. Um, and I don't quite share that view. I think that spirit can sort of break with reason um, and isn't always necessarily the loyal ally of it that it seems to be in the Phaedrus. But in the Phaedrus, we do get this picture where it seems like it's always the loyal ally. And I think that um, one answer I have to that, or one thought I have about that, is just that in the context of the myth that tripartition appears in, what's being dramatized is the soul of somebody who is either a philosopher or a candidate for being a philosopher. Um, it's somebody who, in other words, is already pretty morally good. And so we do see that the, the, the good horse in the metaphor is consistently obedient to the charioteer that is reason. Um, but I think that might have to do more with the fact that we're talking about kind of a, a relatively narrow class of what, what kinds of souls we have in mind here. Um, I don't think that the myth is supposed to illustrate or, or claim that everybody's it, it, the, the internal dynamics of everybody's souls work the way that the philosophers does um, in that in that instance. Um, so I think I think that's that would be my answer, uh, particularly with the Phaedrus in mind. I think that um, it, it's a case of like uh, context and what exactly is being focused on, and sort of a difference of emphasis rather than a, a, a complete difference of view. But thank you so much. Let's give the last question to Elizabeth Loveland. Thank you. Um, just to uh, take you all back, um, if you haven't seen the flyer uh, that went out for this uh, this talk, um, Oxford University Press has provided us with a 30% discount code uh, for purchasing the book. So I know several of you had mentioned that you haven't yet had a chance uh, to look through that or to read through it. Um, let me take you back to the flyer if you uh, uh, are, are interested in purchasing uh, then again with that 30% discount. Final question um, as we wrap up, uh, Josh, um, I was thinking about appetite. I'm wondering if you could whet all of our appetites uh, with what, very briefly, is is what is next on the horizon in terms of your work? Um, that is a great question. I am also eagerly awaiting an answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so no, the, uh, so there's there's a few different things that I, that I have going on. So one thing is that um, I'm currently working on revising a co-authored paper with um, Kirsty Ironside, who's here in attendance, and. Essentially, the paper um, is uh, based on an idea that I got uh, that the search she had in a paper that she wrote and that sort of matched up really well with the contents of the book. And it has to do with Plato's treatment of women in the Republic and his. And so what we do is sort of engage with the history of feminist interpretations of uh, Plato's uh, view of women in the Republic. And we sort of use this two-sided theory of Thumos to sort of illuminate some of the things Plato's trying to do. So um, I do have some like projects like that that are sort of like things that were loosely related to the book but didn't quite fit into the book that I kind of want to wrap up. But I'm also just like kind of enjoying this time to like read a lot and figure out what I want to what I want to research next. Uh, well that's a great way to uh, to, to kind of segue. Um, having the opportunity to, to read is Maybe we all uh, don't look back fondly on studying for comps. Not that this is uh, like studying for, for comprehensive exams, but being able to read uh, is a pleasure in and of itself. Uh, it was been a definite pleasure uh, to, to learn more about your work, um, certainly to take me out of my, my own field. Um, thank you all very, very much for joining, um, particularly a uh, large thanks out to, uh, to, to Nick for um, asking incisive questions, moderating today. Thank you as well to the Humanities Center for hosting. Um, I hope you all have a good rest of the day. Uh, and again, thank you. Yes, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you all. Congratulations, Josh. Thank you. Congratulations. Congrats, Josh. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for coming indeed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for organizing. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. I enjoyed it so much. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, thank you, thank thank you, you all. You. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, I'm just staying here to see if, if, if anyone you. wanted any last words, but. Uh, yeah, Nick, that, that um, was fun. That was great fun.
Yeah, thank, thank you again so much for, for doing this. I really what, appreciate what it. A pleasure. I'm so glad you asked. Cheers. Awesome.